So I'm James Willig. I'm uh, I'm a member of the Division of Infectious Disease in the Department of Medicine. And uh, I have the, uh, the great honor to work within the Research and Informatics Service Center and really work on a lot of uh, uses of technology to potentiate uh, research, patient care, and education. I think that UAB medicine is really undergoing an exciting time. I think there's a lot of national trends like the population health movement and things that are changing in healthcare in general. And I think that the use of technology in the UAB healthcare system is really moving towards how do we capture data outside of the healthcare system and how do we really extend the healthcare setting outside of the traditional hospital ER outpatient clinic to reach into people's homes. In terms of asking about what we've done with electronic data and how we use that effectively, let me speak to a concept that I think is very important when you think of electronic data. And it's a concept that I like to call the innovation space. And the innovation space, if you will, it's the product of on the y-axis being the analytics of the sophistication of your enterprise. Each one sort of brings up on the y-axis. And on the x-axis, you have what are the different types of data that you've captured that you can retrieve and deploy to do different analyses. Analyses for whatever reason, whether it's quality and safety, whether it's research, or whether it's to, for patient care. Now, with that as a background, one always has to have an eye towards what new data type can you capture? What new data type can you bring into the ecosystem of the UAB medicine so that you can extend the capabilities of what we can do across the board? The areas that I've been spending a lot more time with with the team and with a, just a bevy of collaborators, just a, there's a tremendous amount of really intelligent people around here that I have the, the great honor of spending time with. Uh, but some of those ideas are capturing patient reported outcomes first within a clinic setting, making them part of routine care. There's also capturing data outside of the healthcare system, patient reported outcomes and biosensor type data. How can we capture, use that data to really monitor people and do a better job of taking care for them? And ultimately, another area that I've been fairly excited to work, up, to work with is using technology to really change education a little bit. We have a series of millennial learners that are now in our ecosystem and basically a lot of old teaching techniques that we've used, the traditional go to the classroom, go to the blackboard, aren't necessarily the only way to capture their attention. And there's other ways that we can approach them on their cell phones, on their mobile devices, on their computers at home, and really have them use things like gamification to really set personal goals and to compete with each other, all in the purpose of becoming more adept at their discipline of choice. In terms of capturing patient-reported outcomes within the clinic setting, we've been doing some exciting work, particularly in the Kirkland Clinic and in the 1917 Clinic, where we actually have panels of patient-reported outcomes that are of interest to the specialty that we can capture during the process of routine care. These would include things like if I'm a pain researcher, I might do a basic signs and symptom screening, and depending on which signs and symptoms are more exacerbated, I might bring in a specific you know, pain uh, measure, or I might bring in a physical uh, quality of life measure, uh, physical functioning measure, different types of things responding to the patients rather than just taking a sheet of paper and doing a review of systems, rather they do it electronically and we bring in other domains that are relevant to their care that day based on what they answered and what's going on. Um, we've been taught, we've been implemented that in several clinics in the 1917 clinic, in the Turkland clinic, and we're moving into pediatrics, which presents a very intriguing issue because all of a sudden you have one session, part of the questions are to be answered by the caregiver, and part of the questions are to be answered by the patient. So it's some interesting things about where you are and who's uh, holding the device at that time that we've been looking at. Here's some specific examples. When people are using their patient reported outcomes, when they're filling them out, there's actually a notification functionality when they complete an assessment. So if you complete an assessment and it says that you are suicidal, in the 1970 clinic, you'll have pages that go immediately to a psychologist and to a social worker. They coalesce with the person running the, watching the screen that day. They get the room number where the patient is at and then a protocol is activated where people go into the room and do a full assessment for safety and have a recommendation before the healthcare provider ever gets to the room. So by the time I get to see that patient, I have a psychologist waiting for me in front of that room that tells me, this is what's going on with your patient. These are their current plans. Um, this is my recommendation to optimize their care today because they are suicidal. We've used the same type of notifications to help us detect intimate partner violence, which is a tremendous problem. I mean. It, 
estimates in the survey in 2006 sort of put it at 25 to 26 percent of women will experience intimate partner violence at some point in their life. Um, in our population, we have a lot of same-sex couples. There's also intimate partner violence there, though there's much less, less literature about it. So we use an intimate partner violence screen as part of our practice to do a better job of detecting who is at risk, who is suffering this, and once detected, we activate a response protocol to make sure that we can assure the safety of that individual. These are two examples in practice of how we use patient-reported outcomes to take better care of the people that uh, we're privileged with seeing. Another application that we do as well is we do study recruitment off of patient-reported outcomes. So a patient can be feeling something, they say that they are depressed, and rather than me having to have a, uh, a research uh, team member go and ask those questions and figure things out, the patient is doing it as part of the routine care process. Because our, mess, our, our mission as part of an academic medical center is both educational, patient care, and research. And if we use technology wisely, we can capture data that can be reused to potentiate each one of those missions. Patient-reported outcomes, I believe, allow us to impact all three of those areas. You know, one of the exciting things that I think is going on is the population health movement. And, and the population health movement is very interesting. It's almost trying to shift our focus from in-hospital type of procedures where one could say, goodness, a healthcare condition deteriorated, and now we need to provide to the top quality care that UAB Medicine is capable of. So how can we bring some of those great things about UAB Medicine out to the community? And how can we detect who's doing well? How can we check in on people and not have them have to come into our emergency departments, into our clinics, and into the hospital? Rather, get the problem early before it's developed to be that severe. So there's two things that I think are very exciting in that space that I really have the privilege of working with. One is with Andrea Charrington in preventive medicine. The other is with Jeff Curtis and the team in rheumatology. Um, these are two apps that we've worked on developing. Uh, the first one is Diabetes Connect. And what it does is it's been used in a pilot setting where we've detected folks in a clinic that have an uncontrolled diabetes. Their provider has been working them for a while. Diabetes is still uncontrolled. They're referred to someone in the clinic who gets that person and enrolls them in the program and they're assigned a community health care worker. The community health care worker then will call that person periodically based on the standardized protocol. They'll call them every couple of weeks. They'll have a conversation. In that conversation, they'll go over different aspects of their health, different aspects of medication compliance, adherence, are they able to acquire and, and purchase those medications? And they'll also talk to the patient about setting specific goals to improve the management of their condition. They'll ask him things like, you're gonna exercise this many minutes a day, or you're going to go ahead and check your blood sugar this many times a day. Now these goals are set, the community healthcare worker will call in the, in the next week and ask about how they've done with those goals over the last five days. Now, you can imagine, that if I have trouble controlling my diabetes, if I have a lot of chaos in my life, when I get this phone call of somebody who cares, somebody who's a UAB medicine representative, who's reaching out to me, who's talking to me, when the qualitative work after this, we hear things from patients like, wow, they do care. It's amazing what a small gesture like that can do. And basically what kind of an impact will that have long-term over a chronic illness? Now it's a pilot study, so I can't tell you, you know, we improved it this much just yet, but I think the proof of concept was there, the technology is there, and certainly the qualitative feedback we've had so far is that people are incredibly appreciative and incredibly engaged with the community healthcare workers that are able to uncover healthcare needs that we wouldn't even think of. Our community healthcare workers say things like, I gave a bunch of rides to patients to get them to their clinic, or I was able to, they had a question about something to do with my illness, I was able to use the technology to message someone in the clinic, they send an answer right back, and when I told the patient that, they were stunned that so quickly they had received an answer and that people in the clinic were interested and actively working to help them despite them not being in the healthcare setting that day. I believe that this approach is very intriguing, particularly people on one side of the digital divide where they might not have the, the facileness with the new technology or they might not have access to it uh, for different socioeconomic circumstances in their life. All of a sudden, by using a community healthcare worker model, speaking with people like with the same condition, people who really understand what you're going through, in many ways more than what I understand what you're going through as your physician, because they've lived there, they've walked that path, they've had to overcome the same challenges. And using technology to facilitate, to give them a work list, to give them a way to reach out, to keep track of a population of folks, really empowers our community to reach out to those people, to work with them, and I think extends the benefits of UAB medicine beyond the walls of the hospital and the clinic, and in a direction that is very consonant with the national trends in population health, and just a tremendous way to impact the community around us. 
So another interesting thing that, that I've had the opportunity to, to contribute to is this great team composed of folks from uh, Health System Information Services, um, the Enterprise Data Warehouse team, particularly Jeff Gordon, the CCTS with uh, Matt Wyatt, John Osborne, and CIS with uh, Stephen Bethard. Um, really using natural language processing to look through the text in physician notes. And natural language processing is very interesting to me. Initially, I thought it was sort of like pressing control find on Word. And every natural language processing person was kind of offended that I would think that. More, it was kind of thinking back to uh, back when, when I was in, in junior high and, and they would do the syntax in the sentence where they would say, you know, this is a verb and this is a noun. And it's, it's much more complicated than what I initially thought it was. But with these software applications actually do is that they can begin to interpret some of the text that's written there. And that's a very exciting thing because you can imagine that a lot of the national reporting we do, a lot of the case detection we do, a lot of the research we do involves people sitting down and reading um, through notes and trying to figure out who has what combination of data elements. And to think that we could make that automatic and to use that technology to bring it to bear in the UAB medicine environment, how many things could we do with that? So one of the cool early applications we did and the thought was always, how do we make this flexible and how do we make it be able to be applicable to multiple problems? So the engine that was built was initially applied to cancer case detection. So we working with, with Ed Partridge and Helen Contreras and, and the wonderful folks in health information management that do an incredible amount of work behind the scenes to find and detect all the cancer cases within UAB Health System and report this uh, locally to the state and nationally so that we can really, this has tremendous implications for um, our, our quality of care scores, our, our cancer institute, all things to really show the richness and the comprehensiveness of UAB's contribution to this disease state. Uh, so folks, this cadre of folks, about eight cancer registrars, will pretty much read every note in the healthcare system and they'll go through it, they'll find out who has cancer and they'll do sort of an abstraction of that. This case, they would spend about two hours every day looking through every pathology report, top to bottom, to figure out who had a malignancy. All of a sudden, we are able to replace that with a combination of technologies, drawing from our enterprise data warehouse infrastructure in terms of diagnostic codes, and also using NLP and some associated technologies to kind of read through the notes and to see if there's any cancer concepts that are there. And all of a sudden, you can take away two hours from everybody's workday, two hours that can then be used to have the information reported and increase the accuracy of the information out there from UAB and to really show UAB's contribution to this disease state and accelerate the entire process. These are exciting findings. Um, it's an exciting application of existing technology to a new type of problem. You know, an, an interesting set of issues that, that I think NLP could be applied to is a lot of the, a lot of the national, national requirements to you know, you need to detect people with certain conditions and you need to offer them a bundle of interventions to help prevent readmission and improve the outcomes of, of their care. And one of those things that UAB is doing under the leadership of Mark Transfield is to detect cases of people with COPD within the health system so that they can access to what they call a COPD bundle when they leave the hospital, again, to improve outcomes and, and, and just do better with that illness, the management of that chronic disease. So interestingly, they have a lot of people manually review charts every day um, to figure out who has COPD, and they look at the DRGs. The DRGs are assigned after a, a hospital admission, and it's more sort of a, in, a term from the billing world. And we're required to find people with a COPD DRG and apply the bundle to them. But what he's done is very beautiful. He's gone beyond that. He has his people look at hospital records and find people that even though they might not have necessarily fallen under that DRG, they actually do have COPD and would benefit from the month, from, from the bundle. So this is a great way that I see the, the folks in UAB Medicine sort of take it a step beyond what's even being nationally required and sort of say, look, we've developed this great intervention. It's certainly gonna help these folks, but there's other folks like this in our health system and let's find a way to detect them. Another really interesting thing that we've been doing, we were lucky to get some uh, HSF uh, funding for this, some, some uh, internal UAB funding, um, which really shows the support of our institution and how UAB Medicine is working to, to try innovative approaches in education, um, was developing software that we call Kaizen. And Kaizen comes from a Japanese word that basically means continuous uh, improvement. 
And it, it was really interesting because it resonated with us as we sat around and we thought, well, we spend a lot of time telling our learners that you have to be lifelong learners, that you're going to walk out from UAB and you're going to learn a heck of a lot more every year using the skills that we gave you as a baseline to get better longitudinally. So we've developed this software that uses principles of andragogy and gamification to present our learners with basically a learning competition. We'll go to some of their best teachers. In medicine, we did this in the internal medicine residency program. The leadership there allowed us to work with the residents and we said, okay. We went to the subspecialist. We said, give us some questions that you think are really important that I should know if I go work with GI what are the top 10 things that as a generalist you'd like me to know about GI? So the entire faculty has written those questions. We package those questions together. We separate our learners into teams. We compete with UAB residency and residents up at, uh, at Huntsville as well. And we just have different rounds during the year. And they have a medical knowledge competition. This is our third year of having that medical knowledge competition in general medicine. And now other people are getting into, into the picture. We have Jarrett White from Surgery, who's come to us and has started a competition with general surgery. So they're engaged, they're learning when they're not in the hospital. We have um, uh, professors in, nurse, in the nurse School of Nursing who are using Kaizen in their remote learning classrooms right now. We have OBGYN, Alice Gefford and her crew are also starting a Kaizen game um, with their chief resident, uh, Nikki Gwynn, sort of running that and getting their learners to learn as well. And we've been, we're in talks with the emergency department, the Department of Anesthesiology, and we've actually put a grant to try to bring Kaizen to people that are in the Zambian prison system, tying into some of the work that the Infectious Disease Department has done um, to diagnose tuberculosis within the Zambian prison system. They've learned during that work that less than half of the prisons are staffed by anybody who knows anything about healthcare. And the only time they get training is whenever every couple of years they can get funding to bring them to a central location and give them a week of lectures. Now, a week of lectures is tough to learn. It's tough to walk away from that with, with all that knowledge retained and to apply that going forward. So we've thought that we can use this approach. Can we divide the, prison, the prisons into teams? Can we have the health officers and some of the prisoners themselves who participate in the healthcare within the prison, all of them work together to go ahead and compete, learn about healthcare, and do a better job of providing healthcare at those remote settings. So all of these are wonderful things about UME Medicine, and I think that the things that we're doing extend through technology beyond the walls of the hospital, and I think even overseas with initiatives like that.